Good evening and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd. We've got another great show for you tonight. We will be talking about freeze dates and show you some of the damage that freezing can do to your trees and shrubs, as well as, of course, answer your gardening questions. At the present time, we cannot uh, answer the phone, but we are still taking all those emails and those pictures. If you'd like to submit a question for a future show, the address is byf at unl.edu. Tell us where you live. And during the week, you can follow Backyard Farmer on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. With that out of the way, we have Matt for the first time with Hello. his sample, yes. which is not green and growing. I brought a nice sheet of paper for my sample. It's not green, it's not growing. <laughs> and it's it was not toilet time, paper. Maybe. Yeah, it's not toilet paper either, <laughs> sorry. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about is a little bit about using pre-emergent herbicide, or pre-emergent uh, carriers on fertilizer and when to use them, how to use them. Um, but I'm gonna focus on, this is actually one label um, talking about you know how to use this this pre-emergent herbicide that is on a fertilizer. So a couple things that I highlighted here is is basically this is a step one crabgrass preventer. I'm not endorsing any certain ones, but I just picked a couple labels and I took a spot out of them. It's not the whole label. Uh, so what this one says is it can be applied at uh, it applies 1.5 pounds of pendimethalin per acre. So 1.5 pounds of pendimethalin per acre would basically be the half rate for that product, for that active ingredient, pendimethalin. Uh, the full rate would be three pounds of active ingredient per acre. So if we're applying this, it says that you should probably, for control, a repeat treatment is recommended after six to eight weeks. And that's below here on the bottom. So it is recommending that you use a second app to meet that three pounds of active ingredient per acre. Uh, another thing that I was going to talk about is the amount of nitrogen in this product is 28%. So the actual rate that we're going to use for this product, and that's what's recommended, is 2.67 pounds of product per thousand square feet. Uh, so out of that 2.67 pounds, to figure out what the nitrogen is, because it's 28-0-7, so 28 is nitrogen, 0 is phosphorus, and 7 is potassium. So to find the nitrogen that we're using, we're using 2.67 pounds of product. We multiply that by 0.28, which would be 28%, and we get 0.75 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. So with this application, if we want to apply that 1.5 pounds of active ingredient, we're going to end up applying uh, 0.75 pounds of nitrogen. So if you are like me and you only want to mow your lawn once a week, that's probably plenty of nitrogen. If you're gonna put down a full rate of another product that's a lot higher in nitrogen, uh, you can expect to be mowing probably twice a week because it's gonna be growing a lot faster. Uh, so that's just kind of looking at uh, one rate for pendimethalin. I got one more sheet here that is another product that it just has a different uh, fertilizer combination, which is 19-0-7, or yeah, it's a 19, sorry. Um, so 19% of it is fertilizer. And if we use a high label rate, which is 5.34 pounds of product per thousand square feet, that is actually going to get us uh, one pound of active ingredient per acre. And that is the high, high rate for most of our cool season grasses of barricade, which is pendimethalin. So that's a different uh, pre-emergent herbicide. I talked about pendimethalin on the first one. This one's barricade. And there's also dimension. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to talk about this one, uh, barricade. So if we're applying that one pound of AI rate or active ingredient, we're going to need to put down 5.34 pounds of product per thousand square feet. And with that, same thing, we're finding the nitrogen. So we take 5.34 times 0.19, which is 19%, and that's what our nitrogen content is in the bag. So with that 5.34 pound of actual product, we're putting down one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet, which is plenty for a spring rate. So I just wanted to kind of go through a couple examples on looking at you know what we're actually putting down. It's really easy to figure them out. Usually they give you a rate and they tell you, but they don't tell you how much nitrogen you're actually putting down. Or some of them don't tell you, like 
exactly how much AI you're going to put down, but uh, that's one way to figure out exactly how how you're applying it or how much you're applying. So it's good to know. Perfect. It's also math, so I'll yes. rely on somebody else. I try. I, <laughs> I don't do math. All right, Kyle. Uh, we talked about whether this is something that we can consume. Yeah, uh, I mean, drink glass I have a nice or... little swizzle stick here, so you know, we can all. <laughs> But no, unfortunately, this is nothing, uh, not, not a tasty libation at least. Um, but I just pulled up, uh, pulled a few of our cedar apple rust galls, because we are starting to see those. And I had put some in water with the goal of trying to get the, these orange teleal horns to, to, really, to really go. Um, but uh, cedar apple rust is well, um, it's a, one of our gymnosporangium rusts, and so it um, infects uh, gym, uh, um, cedar trees, and so uh, cedars and junipers. But then it also goes to apples in the later in the spring, and so. But this time of year, we are starting to see some of these galls um, kind of shoot out these these orange horns, and these orange horns are full of of spores. And then these spores will be um, splashed either via rain or wind, and they'll blow onto uh, onto apples, onto apple trees, or really any sort of um, any prunus tree nearby. And unfortunately, these spores can move upwards of two miles. And so sometimes you'll hear people talk about, well, you can just, if you're concerned about cedar apple rust on the apples, get rid of all the cedar trees in an area, but. Two miles is a long way, and so it's going to be very difficult to remove all of these. Um, and so this is this is one of this is a gall from this year, and this is one from last year as well. Um, and so it's it's already dried up. You can already see, you can see some of the holes where where we had those teleal horns last year. Um, but as far as as far as control. On, a, on the juniper or on the cedar tree, typically there's not a whole lot that you need to do. Um, you can go through and prune out some of the prune out some of the galls if you are, if they're if you're concerned about them being unsightly. But generally, they don't cause massive decline of the cedar tree. Now, if you're concerned about your apples, once we start to see these these orange horns emerging in the spring, that's going to be an indication of when you'll want to apply a. Um, a protected fungicide application to your apple trees. Again, because these, these orange horns here are full of spores, they blow onto the apple tree. If you miss this timing, you're not gonna have any control. And so later in the season, I would guess probably late July, we'll start getting a lot of questions about apple trees that have a lot of rust on them. And what can we do for them? And we say, well, wait until next spring. When you, once you start seeing these teleal horns, that's an indication of when you'll want to apply the fungicide to your apple tree. Uh, and chlorothalonil works quite well uh, for control, but all, uh, copper um, products work very well for, for control as well. All right, thank you, Kyle. And it's a, a good bad year for those uh, galls. Yeah, I mean, the, the warm, wet weather that we had about a week ago really, really sent them popping, so. All right, thanks. Jeff, you brought in something prettier than the plant of the week. Oh, well, that wasn't my intention to show you up, so I just want to say that publicly. Um, well, I brought in a couple of things. We were talking about things we can't eat or don't want to be around to eat, and something here, he's making cocktails with uh, cedar apple rust, but um, we have a couple of things. So the, the tree out front here, um, what we have here with branches, so we're looking at a crab apple, so uh, they're just getting ready to do their thing, and this is maypole. Mm. which is a fun crab apple. They're, it's a good sized one that's more upright growing than a lot of your crab apples. And then it puts on a fairly good sized crab that's, that's quite edible, I've eaten a lot of them. And um, so if you are looking for an apple, we were talking about here as far as being a vector with the cedar apple rust. Um, this is one that uh, seems to be very resistant to a lot of the diseases. It's a very clean tree. Um, it's again, flowers really well, and then puts on an edible apple, kind of like a dolgo if you've had that crab apple. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so it's a good choice if you're looking for something in the yard that isn't uh, maybe the higher maintenance eating apple that you think of. The taller one we have here is a uh, red bud. So the red buds are just getting ready to do this uh, their thing. And this particular one was a little farther along than some of the others. So mm -hmm. I thought that was fun to bring in. And then the white flowering branches we have here are off of a um, Shadblow serviceberry. 
So again, even in the snow and the wind, this one was holding together pretty well. So Beautiful combination. And again, the service berry is edible if you get there before the birds. Yeah, that's right, exactly. So, all right, thanks, Jeff. Nice, nice samples. Okay, so Matt, you get the first uh, questions tonight from a viewer with pictures. This is a viewer who, uh, she thinks she narrowed this weed down to hoary cress, and she sent in a really fabulous set of pictures, by the way, so it's not just one and done. She sent, uh, this is in an iris garden in Cass County. She is wondering, is there a project, or a project, a product that will be a project yeah, that would be effective control? Um, she's digging it out now, but she says this is really a commitment. Yeah, that's, uh, I did, I tried to find anything else it could have been, but I'm pretty sure it, I narrowed it down to hoary crest as well or white top, so it'll actually get pretty tall, uh, two to three feet with those white flowers on top. It's a perennial, and the reason you're seeing it spread so crazily, especially on this picture, uh, it does send out uh, rhizomes, and it will shoot off new shoots off of that, and that's kind of how it spreads, and it's, it's actually pretty aggressive if it's, it has the right conditions, and it can take over an area pretty quick. Um, so in the irises, uh, something that would work to control it would be uh, Roundup or glyphosate if you could actually spot apply it to the plants uh, or wipe it on with a 5% solution. Uh, another one would be uh, a 2,4-D, especially this time of year before the irises, I don't know, are they fully emerged yet or they're still mm -hmm. just kind of popping out of the ground? Mm -hmm. uh, there's been some, some people talking about it, researched, uh, looked at it, uh, but there's no label for irises for 2,4-D products. So you still want to be careful, but I've read where if you apply it soon enough before they start elongating and shooting out the flowers, um, you should be okay. So I would test a small area with that. Um, and that would be another way that you could control that broadleaf weed in the iris patches. All right, thanks, Matt. Okay, we have uh, pine issues. We okay. had pine issues last week. Your first set here is actually uh, a viewer who lives south and east of Gothenburg. So she's out there a ways. She's got seven on the farm, 1966. Lower branches were limbed up. She says the needles are, are really browning, and this is especially true on the east and west sides. So that's kind of your first one, okay. Kyle. And then you've got another viewer uh, in a different location, backyard, a little closer together some do have a fungus look and he says west and northwest parts of the trees so we'll go back to that first one in imperial and and see what you think here well um first thing i would kind of start to wonder about about this one these trees are starting to get pretty old um and so you know 50 or I'm not, I'm not good at math, so maybe maybe I should have Matt figure out this. Sure, uh, 60 years 60 old. 60 years <laughs> old, thank you. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so the tree is getting to be a little bit old, and especially out, out in the Gothenburg area, it tend to be pretty sandy soils too, so not the greatest, not the greatest growing conditions for that. So, so this may just, be, may just be a tree that is kind of nearing, nearing the end of its life cycle as well. Um, but if you are seeing a lot of, a lot of brown needles on the, on the west side and then also maybe on kind of the south side as well, that can be an indication of winter burn. Mm -hmm. As we get those, um, we get those harsh winds um, out of the south and west that kind of just dry out the needles and we have just some, some winter burn that, that can occur. Um, so that's my thought for the, for the first one. And for the second one, there are really a handful of a handful of fungal diseases that are attacking are attacking pine trees. And typically, they do start from the from the base of the tree um, and move and move up. Typically, you're going to have more severe issues um, in more crowded areas where we have decreased airflow through the canopy. Um, and so, if it is a windbreak situation, there we can have a lot of fungal issues. Um, and so, some of those I. Was, un, was unable to, uh, to tell based on that picture, but Dothostroma needle blight is a big one. Um, and there's also a brown spot of pine, which we've been seeing a little bit more of in Nebraska as well. And then Diplodia um, shoot blight could be, could be another one. If I had to guess, I would say that, um, I would um, guess Dothostroma needle blight was the case, um, was the problem with that one. And as far as, con 
uh, control for dothostroma goes, really um, you're looking at, at two different fungicide applications um, in a given year. And so that first one, you wanna have that application occurring um, right when those needles are, are beginning to expand. And then that second application is gonna be about three to four weeks later when those needles are fully expanded. All right, thanks, Kyle. And again, it's kind of been a tough year on evergreens for most of the state. It's, yes, yeah. it really has been. All right, uh, Jeff, it's also been a tough year for your first set of pictures, which okay. is maples. And the first, uh, I think the first two pictures are of the same tree, and, and of course, she is really wondering what is the prognosis for this? She she thinks that's critter damage. It's like There's, squirrel damage. Yeah, there are a lot of issues that are well beyond squirrel on that. So, right. is this a former tree? It looks like you know. It looks like it's suffering from sun scald and a few other things. So, I think this is an opportunity to start with something else. Well, and I think isn't that a, through a chain link fence? Uh, I think it's just the way the branches, the branches. are. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty nasty. Yeah. And then your second one is, uh, this is autumn blaze maple. Mm -hmm. About 10 years ago, they're showing um, some scald, missing bark on the west and the northwest, woodpecker holes, some fungi, some mushrooms. Um, this is gretna. And then, of course, we've also got that strange root system. Yeah. So I, you know, it, it looks like at planting, um, Perhaps the, the root system wasn't teased out enough at that time. Uh, it kind of looks like it's still sitting in the basket to the shape of that uh, little mulcher in the way the roots are. So, so that's something to remember. If you purchase a bald and burlap tree, you want to make sure that you take the basket off of the tree. And you have to do it carefully. Um, but it's important to get as much of the wrapping and the basket off of the tree. And if you're doing a potted tree, again, you want to make sure that you look at the root system, uh, feather, tease out some of those circling roots, do some cutting. Uh, I know it seems dramatic at the time, but it's important that you do it at that time so you, we avoid some of that stuff going down the road. And then we talk about mulching, making sure we have enough room around the tree so we protect it from mower damage and all that stuff. So that just kind of helps keep it away from the, the different funguses and diseases we might affect, be affected by it, and certainly Matt running into it with a mower, so. Yes. <laughs> that is Just his goal in out. life. Yeah. <laughs> Makes you go fast. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jeff. Well, you know, we told you last week we'd be looking at praying mantis egg cases tonight. We'll show you that at a later date because those chilly and white conditions around the state may have caused some damage and probably a few do-overs. The last freeze date for most of the state is right around the corner. John Porter will tell us it does all depend on where you live. One of the questions that we get a lot in the office is asking when can I plant something, when is it safe to plant, or will my plants be damaged? So today what we're going to talk about is the last frost and freeze date, and also talk about a little bit of the damage that people got in their gardens when we had colder temperatures the week after Easter, and also maybe even a little hail damage. So whenever we're talking about the last frost and freeze date, we actually are talking about probability and statistics. Uh, how likely is it going to be that we have a frost or a freeze on certain dates? The National Weather Service actually computes this looking at the data from the last three decades, and they take a look at the last dates that there are frosts in the year, they compute an average, and they make some tables of those probabilities. And what they do is they provide those probabilities for 50% or 90% uh, or 10%. And we look at those differences. And what we can see is that on certain dates, it is 50% likely or less that we're going to have frost. That's one of the dates that we look at. Then we also can look at the 10% probability. That means that it's basically almost impossible that we'll have frost on that date. And what we can do is use those dates whenever we're planning and planting our garden. Sometimes when I ask people when their last frost date is, they'll tell me that it's Mother's Day. Uh, and that's sort of a good time to think about those probabilities, but really it depends on where you are in the state. For us here in Omaha, our 50% chance of last frost is April 21st. That means it's about 50-50. If we want to be a little bit more sure, we go out to the 10% date. That's 10% that the, that the temperature will be that 
degree or colder, and that is May 4th. Now, if we look at some of the extremes in the state, we go all the way out to Agate, Agate uh, Fossil Bed National Park. That is the longest time we have to go until we get a frost-free date. Those are June 9th for 50% and July 2nd for the 10% frost date. And on the other corner of the state, Falls City, April 19th is the 50% date and the 10% date is May 2nd. So what can you plant in your vegetable garden based on those times and those dates? Well, the things that are really susceptible to frost are the warm season plants like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. Those cannot stand a frost at 32 degrees and they will die. However, some of those other crops that we grow like cabbage, broccoli, cold crops, spinach, onions, they can go in before those dates because they are cold hardy. Whenever we're looking at some of those crops though, they don't tolerate a freeze, which is at 28 degrees, and that's a whole other set of numbers that we're looking at. And that's had farmers and gardeners scrambling this week after Easter because the temperatures have gotten to that critical point where they could freeze even some of those cold hardy crops. So it's easy to remember today that it's Nebraska as it's freezing and snowing. Sometimes you do have to throw that data out the window and just wait. I think the low was two in Alliance mm. earlier this week. Yes. Ooh, holy cow, that's, that's cold. All right. Okay, Matt. So we have some weed questions right. since Bill refuses. And uh, this first one is actually an Omaha viewer. She found this growing up against her brick pavers in a narrow bed. She thought it was burdock. Then she took a shovel and dug it up and found this monster big long root system. Uh, went off to the side. She's not sure why. It's probably mm. because of the pavers. Uh, so she's wondering if that is indeed burdock and how do you get rid of that one? So what do we think? Yes, it is indeed burdock and usually you do not get that taproot mm -hmm. because it's so deep. I always end up breaking it off and then it'll regrow because you can never get that far down. Normally it'll grow straight down, but since you had it on pavers, it grow horizontally and that's why you were able to get it out. And uh, one way to get rid of those would be pull it just like you did. Otherwise, most 2,4-D dicamba combinations or products will work to control those. Uh, generally, it might take two apps if you're not using a high label rate with that. So it can be kind of a difficult perennial that is uh, difficult to control. The other bad thing is I usually run into these when they're about two or three feet tall. <laughs> and then my jeans are covered in all these spiny little look yeah. like cockaburs almost or like little burrs mm -hmm. and that's that's when I it's too late then but and they spread they're, they're pretty nasty yeah, they spread you're, pretty you're easily. spreading them all yep. over because of your clothing yep all right your second one is um, she says this has taken over the flower garden and she thinks this is also a weed she's digging it out comes out in giant clumps of soil what is this should she dig it how else can she kill it and yeah I, I'm pretty sure this one is spider wart mm -hmm. or spider lily mm -hmm. and it I haven't dealt with it much I don't know if you guys have seen much around here but it can be very aggressive and take over basically the entire area mm -hmm. uh, so one way to get rid of it is you're probably gonna have to treat it because if you try and dig it out it'll actually spread through its roots that you leave behind and it can just make a bigger mess you'd really have to excavate quite a bit to to get the soil out and start new um, and that would be one way to do it. Otherwise, uh, multiple applications of glyphosate or Roundup would probably be your best option because you're going to need to kill that extensive root system below the soil uh, without leaving any behind. So it's going to take probably a year or two before you actually get a hold of it. Uh, so good luck with that. Otherwise, enjoy. I think <laughs> enjoy the. It has it has little flowers, but oh, yeah. I hear that they only last day. one day or half a day. So they flower they last half a day. So yeah, really you know, pretty. Maybe you can just enjoy the flowers for half a day <laughs> if you get out there early enough. Yeah, do watch that plant. We uh, it it's pretty aggressive. We have it in the backyard farmer yeah. garden. It I have it at home. It was there when we moved in, and 28 years later, it's yeah. so it just. Yeah. just takes off. Yeah, it does. <laughs> okay, uh, Jeff, you have, oops, it froze. Your first one here is, um, let's see. Oh, Kyle, I forgot Kyle. See, I knew I was going to do that because you guys are in the wrong order. You're just, right. just mix, mix, mixing things up. Mixing we up. don't care. Yeah. Whatever you do. <laughs> so we were when we got here. Yeah, we're here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, so this is Auburn, Kyle. Okay. 
And this is a cherry tree that, uh, this is the only picture she sent us, but she says the trunk is not looking great. She wants to know what's wrong with it. It's only about four or five years old. Okay, um, yeah, so what's going on here is gamosis is the, the general term for that. Um, and generally gamosis is just kind of sap that is kind of leaking out of, leaking out of cracks or other wounds that, other wounds that have occurred. Um, Difficult to say what 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 the what the main cause of this gamosis was, but a lot of times um, a lot of our a lot of our bacterial canker diseases can can cause similar things like this. And with it being a cherry, I mean you're going to kind of would wonder about um, maybe wonder about some uh, fire blight or some of our some another bacterial disease. But you know, looking at wounds that close to the ground, um, there was quite a bit coming out. I would be watching that tree fairly carefully, um, but maybe start thinking about something else to plant there um, in the meantime, because it probably will not, probably won't survive a whole lot longer, unfortunately. That looked like kind of a poor connection to the trunk too, yep. maybe a branch cut. So thanks, Kyle. You have a second one, and this is, uh, we talked about this last week, but now we have picks. Okay. We have a tree with this growth on its branches that look like dung. So uh, is it detrimental? They wonder what this is. I think we might have a second picture that's close up and personal maybe on this one. And if we don't, I don't think we even need it. There, oh, there, no, there it is. Nope, so that is that is a black knot. Um, can be found on um, attack a lot of our a lot of our stone fruits. See it a lot on um, a lot on wild wild plums especially. Um, but it is a it's a fungal pathogen that's kind of causing causing that growth. But the kind of the cool thing about black knot is that dung like structure, for lack of a better term, is it's not just the fungus and it's not just plant material either. And so as the fungus grows, it's actually releasing some releasing some different um, chemicals and hormones that um, create, that force the plant to, to kind of grow those, those galls or those knots. Um, and as far as control goes, you can prune those out. Looked like there were quite a few, so pruning would be, would be difficult. Other thing, um, there are fungicides work fairly well for, for black knot. Unfortunately, we are getting to the end of the time when you would want to apply any sort of fungicide for that. So typically with black knot, again, chlorothalamil works, um, works fairly well for it. And you're looking at an application kind of early to mid spring to, um, in order to protect the, in order to, in order to protect the plums. Now, if they're just, oh, it's a wild plum thicket, you don't care all that much about it, I would go out and maybe do a little bit of pruning um, as best you can. Well, then just kind of enjoy the enjoy the dung on the branches. It's the right the the Such one a, the catchphrase for tonight's show: yeah. dung on the branch. There we go. That'll go viral. Sounds terrible. Yeah. <laughs> All right, now it's your turn, Jeff. Okay. Uh, this is actually from out southwest Colbertson, Nebraska. Oh. So there you go, Jeff Colbertson. Yeah, named after me. Um, this this peony froze on our first round of freezing last week, and of course, then it's been terrible since. She wonders, come you back. Know, PDs no. are resilient, so I would be, pay I, we have a lot on campus, I'm sure yeah. after tonight, they're gonna be looking like this as well, as well yeah. so. Just wait and see. I think so. Yeah, yeah. And, and then we have actually two different viewers who have rhubarb in their eastern part of the state. Uh, they're shooting their flower, their flowers right out of the ground already, mm -hmm. and they're wondering why that happened. Well, I, and I think we talked about this about before the show as well. So this is another response many times to uh, some cold temps and some sort of injury. So you'll see this with rhubarb. Uh, it's not unusual to see plants do this early on, especially if they're older plants. So if they're older than three years old, um, they may have a tendency of it's a particular selection. Uh, Victoria is one that's common that many times will do this after it gets three to five years old. So you can reset its clock by dividing it. So that's something to think about here going in the future is, is thinking about dividing that, going ahead and you'll avoid that a little bit. But otherwise just cut them off, just take your knife, keep them off, keep them cleaned out and, um, and you'll be fine. All right, thanks Jeff. 
Well, with the colder temperatures this week and hail around our area, we were not in a hurry to get planting. So this week in the backyard farmer garden, Terry is inside the greenhouse getting our plants prepared. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're gonna kind of show you kind of our step-by-step -step of how we've gotten our seeds started to date. A lot of people are emailing us, asking us how we do this and how to do this at home. So we really started a lot of these, a lot of the more ornamental ones really early. So January, February. So some of those you probably won't be able to get done, but a lot of the vegetables you can still get done if you can get to them this weekend. What you can do is you can start them in a tray like this. You can broadcast them and then move them up into bigger pots as they grow. Or you can just do individual seeds into smaller containers like, and you can use anything in your house. So we have some egg cartons that you can use. If you're eating yogurt, you can use yogurt cups. Just make sure that you put some holes in the bottom of that with either a nail or a screw or a, or a, a screwdriver and a hammer and so that the water goes through it. Make sure you get good soilless mix. Don't go out and get garden or soil out of your garden or anything like that. Um, all of the nurseries are pretty much open. More and more I'm seeing online saying that they have online sales, curbside pickup. Some of them are even delivering items to your house. So just give them a call, see if they're open, see what they have and they'll be able to help you out. So you too can have a backyard farmer garden just like our backyard farmer garden. So stop by and check us out. You know, we're just like all of you gardeners. We cannot wait to get our garden planted. We are going to wait until the garden gets warmer and we get warmer as well. Yes. Now, of course, it's time for everybody's favorite, the lightning round. Are you ready, Jeff? I'm ready. All right. Uh, we have a number of viewers that have purchasing roses that are in full flower. The shrubs are in full flower. Mm -hmm. Plant them, cut them, prune them. I wouldn't plant them. I'd probably keep them someplace protected at night if it's cold and you can set them out on the deck during the day till things are, till we're May 2nd or May 5th or something like that. Mother's Day. Mother's Day, there you go. Okay, we have a viewer in Norfolk. Uh, she sent us a picture that we're not using, but it's pretty, it's pretty significant. It's a 70 year old walnut tree. Wow. Uh, and it's uh, starting to show some cracking of the bark and sloughing. Is there anything they can do or is this a former tree? You know, I would, uh, something that old, I'd want to bring in maybe your local extension agent or a certified arborist to take a look at it and make sure that it is safe before we did, made any decision. All right, uh, this is an Omaha viewer who wonders if we recommend doing any wound dressing on broken branches. No, we don't. We want to make, clean up the wound, make sure you have a nice clean cut. And there's some good information on the Backyard Farmer website. We've done lots of pruning videos, so do that, but we don't want to dress the wound. All right, um, do you need to buy bean seed that is inoculated to get good germination? I think it helps. I actually bought some inoculate for our beans. Uh, so yeah, I would do that. I think any legume, it helps to inoculate them. All right, excellent, thank you, Jeff. You ready, Kyle? Born ready. Mm -hmm. We'll see. <sighs> Your first one is actually about cedar apple rust galls, okay. and the question uh, from the viewer is, will these cold freezing temperatures affect their sporulation? Um, no, not really. They, um, they can, the, the galls are made, meant to tolerate Nebraska winters, so once it warms up, once it is wet, they're gonna be right back going again. All right, without even seeing a picture, uh, when we have an oak with a crack, dead tissue and mushrooms at the base of that tree, is that something that you as a pathologist would worry about? It is, um, there are, there are uh, armillaria is one of, the main, one of the main mushrooms that we would start to worry about. And anytime there is mushrooms sprouting from the base of the tree and that there's, there are those cracks, that's just a wound or it's rotting, dead wood, and so I uh, yeah, need to start paying more attention to that tree. All right, uh, this is a Murdoch viewer who wants to know whether viruses survive on seed or in the soil. It depends on the virus. All right, this is a Grand Island viewer who has red twig dogwood that has, they keep cutting the cankered canes out. Yep. Does it get into the crown of a plant? Um, it depends how close to the ground those cankers are. Um, typically, anytime we're pruning cankers, 
we want to make sure that we're going down at least another eight to 12 inches below where we're seeing that canker just to make sure we're getting all of the, all the fungal or bacterial pathogens. Nice job, gentlemen. Long answers, that's that was, okay. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> that's okay, that's all right. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so the first question for you is, this is an Omaha viewer who wonders whether nimble will has actually been something that has become more prevalent in the last couple of years. Um, it's always been around, it's just you see it more in your yard because it grows year after year, so you just see more of it. All right, um, this is a Holdridge viewer who wants to know whether new sod should be fertilized. Yes, I would fertilize it because it would be one that's probably needing it. All right, uh, we have a viewer who has a dog path worn it through his yard. He's been, spent two years reseeding. Is it time to give up? Uh, see if you can change the dog's path. <laughs> Good luck with but that. But no, it's never, never give up. <laughs> put something so maybe they have to go around a different way, but you're gonna till it up, put seed in it, and you can probably get some to grow if you keep the dog off. All right, this is a Loretto viewer who wonders whether you can use pre-emergence around new seedling trees. Uh, I would say yes, but I wouldn't get too close to the base because it could wash down. It, it pretty much binds to the top inch of the soil. All right, uh, how do you kill goose grass and zoysia grass? Wait till it's, oh, let's see here. Goose grass and zoysia grass. <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. Kill the zoysia too if you I'd say rock. you could, if it's dormant, but it's not gonna be dormant because it's gonna be grown at the same time. <laughs> um, I don't know, that's a good one. I'd say a claim would be the only one which is sulfentrazone. Sulfentrazone, all right. And let Rock have it next time he's on yeah, so we can I say suppose. just kill the zoysia. <laughs> yep, kill the zoysia, you can't though. <laughs> you win, you win, you won anyway. <laughs> All right, so Jeff, these are, uh, these are actually plants of the week. What do we have? Well, you have a couple. So these are survivors of the, of the cold, right? They are, <laughs> yeah. So our, our blue one we have a lot of is Mertensia Virginia Bluebells, uh, which is a fun early uh, flower, you know, and you can see how bright they are and how nice the leaves are, so, which is, you know, typical of this plant, that as soon as things warm up a little bit, it's really doing its thing. So, mm -hmm. so if you have a garden spot that you're looking for something that you'd like to have something early in, this would be a good choice. And then the uh, little taller one with the purple flowers, one of my favorite, so this is a lily, Fritillaria, and uh, it is one of my favorite plants. We've had it um, in Maxwell Arboretum years ago, we planted them, and they are just a, a fun little plant to have. So, and as they get older, the flowers get bigger and bigger. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's, it's a I really like that plant. It has little checkers. Yeah. So that's another name for it's it. It's very, very unusual. Yeah. It is, yeah. There's a white one too, and the white one actually has little checkers on it. I think you have some in Maxwell. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. Those, uh, those actually laid down flat in the first cold last week and then came back up again. I figured they deserved their day on the air for living. <laughs> All right, uh, Matt, so pictures this time around. Speaking of Nimble Will, maybe. Yeah, this is an Omaha viewer, sent us again some good pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, warm weather grass that they'd like to control. It's invaded the bluegrass and the fescue. Tough and tenacious. So what is this? Yes, it does look like nimble will. Mm -hmm. um, it is a warm season grass and generally it greens up after our cool season grasses green up. Mm -hmm. uh, not too far or too, too long afterwards. And generally it's shoots out stolen. So you're seeing those nodes that you took uh, pictures of. Uh, there's actually stolons that shoot out and that's kind of how it spreads year after year. Those grow on top of the ground and then they send out, they send down roots and new shoots. Um, so that's why we don't normally see it when they're just a small patch, but every year it gets bigger and bigger and then it becomes a problem. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't die, it's pretty, pretty hardy. Uh, so the only product that there is labeled for it would be uh, Callisto or Tenacity, which is Mesotrione. And the other way you could do it would be Roundup, kill the area. You might have to do multiple apps, four weeks apart, let it regrow, apply again. You're gonna have to kill a spot in your lawn, but then you could reseed a new, um, whatever your lawn type is, tall fescue, bluegrass, and that'd be another way to get rid of it. 
And the downside is the birds apparently seem to think that that's good nesting material. Oh yeah, see, then they can just it spread does. around. Spreads, you know, yeah. spreads all over the place. Yeah, yeah. maybe that's why it's more prevalent. Yeah. The birds. The birds are prevalent. Yeah. Yeah. It's the birds' fault. <laughs> all right, thanks, Matt. Okay, tree time. Awesome. So uh, we have a blue spruce that started dropping needles late last summer and through the winter, gets plenty of breeze on the healthy side, sprayed the trees with fungicide. This is along the river near St. Paul and the soil is a sandy loam. Um, doesn't think it's needle rust, but what is it? Well, um, first, blue spruces, um, sandy soil is not, the, not ideal for spruces um, and so could just be not the greatest, not the greatest site, um, but especially since you are seeing more injury on the um, on the side on the denser side that does not get as much airflow, does uh, make it seem like it could be fungal. And there are really two different fungal pathogens that we have um, that affect spruce trees like that. Um, and so we have Rhizosphera and Stigmina. Both are needle casts, and they can kind of turn the needles that that purplish color. Um, mm -hmm. Later in the season, you may start to uh, may look at those needles, and you'll see some kind of black pimples that are coming out of the coming out of the um, the needles as well, and those are the fruiting structures. Um, and so, fortunately, whether it's Rhizosphera or Stigmina needle cast, control is pretty much the same for for both of them. Uh, first thing to do is any any pruning to increase airflow through that canopy, decrease leaf wetness period. Um, the other thing is uh, both of these fungi do respond well to uh, two fungicides. Um, chlorothalonil is often recommended to control for rhizosphera. Unfortunately, there are some formulations of chlorothalonil that um, are phytotoxic to blue spruces. Mm -hmm. So if you are going to use chlorothalonil to control rhizosphera, you want to make sure that you are reading that label very carefully and that there, there are no no, there are no phytotoxic effects to the spruces. All right, I think you have one more that's also a spruce that shows the interiors completely, and yeah. so that's one of those. Yep, exactly. Yep, um, yeah. and it's, it hits the hits the inner needles first, where it's a lot where it's wetter, longer, which is that increased humidity that gives it more gives the fungus more time to sporulate and spread. All right, thanks, Kyle. All right, so this is a great picture of a pretty tree for you, Jeff. And what this one is, is this is a, um, she, she says it's a heritage river birch. Okay. She's also saying that it's got, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, she's wondering how to prune it. Okay. So right. what are we gonna suggest? Lifting, thinning? You know, well, I, you can, you know, you can prune off any branch that's uh, a problem for you, but you know, have a nice big mulch bed there, so the tree shouldn't be a problem uh, from that standpoint. If we're looking at uh, things that I would look for when I walk into a tree like this, I'm looking for any kind of crossing branches, anything that might be growing into the other, um, the other canes that are, that are coming out of there. Um, so that would be the one thing I would look at. And if you want to do some for form, you can do that if you want to bring head some back. But birches do a real good job of kind of self-pruning as they age. Mm -hmm. uh, so they'll shade out some of those lower branches. And you'll see that later once they leaf out that some just may not be making it anymore. And those are easy to take off with pruners or handsaws. So birches are, are great from that standpoint. So And then when the wind blows, a bunch of branches will come down too. So. <laughs> okay, thanks, <laughs> Jeff. Well, tonight we've been focusing on how spring freezing temperatures can do some serious damage to our gardens and landscapes. Right now I'm going to take you around the backyard farmer garden to show you what can happen and talk a little bit about what you can do about it. One of the most challenging things for gardeners in the early spring is the threat of freeze damage or frost and of course of the two, freeze is far worse. Herbaceous plants like our beloved tulips and perennials and even some grasses are going to respond differently to really significant freezing temperatures than some of our woody plants. And while it's really devastating to have your tulips sort of go like this when they're just starting to flower, that's not nearly as troubling as what can be either long-term damage or even death in our woody plant material. A plant's tolerance of low temperatures depends first of all on its tolerance level. 
We have some plants that really can't tolerate anything even close to freezing. Others can actually go below freezing for a short period of time. A plant's ability to acclimate to those temperatures is very important. And of course, we start with the zone, where should that plant be growing? And then it is environmental. So where in the landscape have you placed that plant? Is it in a place where the cold air settles and actually those frost or freeze pockets occur? Is it in a place where it gets warm and sunny? Everything blooms, everything breaks bud earlier. So again, we have issues associated with the ability of the plant to tolerate the freeze. Plants also will begin to show that damage in different ways. One of the unfortunate situations in a lot of Nebraska is we had temperatures that set record highs earlier in the winter, which caused plants to actually begin to come out of dormancy. Then we had lows, then we didn't have moisture, then we had highs again setting record temperatures as plants were just beginning to break bud, and that is particularly true of the fruit trees, full flower, and then of course devastatingly low temperatures, so that is really, really tough on plants. What you will see oftentimes and first with plants is you'll see the death of the flower buds. Now it's, it's hard to tell unless you take that bud apart and you look down into the bud itself to see whether or not you have darkness or damage. The same thing is true on foliage. And of course, the question is, will those plants produce fruit? Maybe, maybe not. They may absol absolutely not produce fruit. It may be mushy inside. Ideally, what you will do is leave those plants alone and see how they grow out of it before you decide you're going to have to give up and start over again. Damage is going to be far less likely on plants that have not yet broken dormancy and on plants that are in a more protected microclimate where the temperatures did not get quite so cold, they didn't fluctuate quite as much. Perhaps the soil is a heavier clay, which is going to hold more moisture, which means the root system is also not going to freeze. And that's the really bad part about freeze damage is of course the root system on plants. The quince lost its flowers. It's a tough plant, it will be fine. The choke cherry, of course, is native. It actually was getting ready to flower in different locations. Those flower buds and the foliage looks like a shepherd's crook. It really froze. That's unlikely to damage the plant entirely. And the great thing about plants is their resiliency. If they were chosen properly, put in the right place, managed properly, did not go into the winter too dry, and you are able to take care of them the way you're going to need to during the season. So we hope we're going to be amazed at how several of our landscape trees and shrubs made it through the colder temperatures. All right, wait and see, right? That's all we can do. All we can do. All right, Matt, uh, first one is spots in the turf and the landscape. She's wondering what caused them and can she just go ahead and overseed? Um, yes, that's, I mean, it's, you can oversee that. You're probably going to have to try and bring in some new cultivars, go with a good uh, certified seed. That way you're getting, you know you have uh, a good seed to start with. It also looks like there's some mulch that washed into there. So, I mean, maybe tilling it up and actually starting over would probably be a good choice. All right. And then your second one is a papillion viewer that has a sunset maple that um, they don't think the tree is planted deep enough because it's got surface roots, which is probably not the issue, but the lawn is thin and they've got these little roots and they wonder what they can do to be able to get turf to grow in that spot. Yeah, you're really not gonna get good turf ever under a tree <laughs> like that. So one thing you can do is you're probably gonna have to seed almost every year over seed to try and get grass to grow. But as soon as that leaf, or the, the tree is full of leaves, it's gonna shade it out and it's gonna thin out and die. So. Try maybe a couple different cultivars, do something with bluegrass, tall fescue, a little bit of red fescue in it so that whatever's able to take and stay will. And you do that a couple years and you'll have a better stand. And water it because it's going to be dry under the tree. Exactly. And don't, uh, don't cut those roots. Well, if you just cut the tree down. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kyle, uh, this is a viewer uh, near Blair. They have 14 concolor fir. Only two of them have this particular issue. They got browning of the needles. They pruned it out, but it's back. They have full sun most of the time. They are on the north end. Uh, they think it's delphinella and, and are wondering what we think. And of course, then they're wondering if they can prune all that dead out and still get a tree out of it. 
Yeah, um, definitely. That definitely looks like Delphinella. Um, it's a fungal pathogen that primarily hits hits furs, um, and it really hits concolor furs especially hard. Um, unfortunately, we are kind of getting past the time of any sort of treatment for that. When um, you want you want to apply a fungicide for Delphinella, kind of um, when those shoots are still in the bud, um, and so we're kind of are getting past that time. But if you would would do some pruning, have a have a good uh, spray schedule, I, w I think the trees would come back just fine. All right, uh, quickly on this one, Jeff. This is also trees, three and a half inch caliper brandywine. Wants to take an axe to the roots on this one. Um, so is that a really good idea? It's not a good idea. If you have stem girdling roots, uh, you can contact someone who has an air spade that can come in and try to expose some of that and, okay. and then properly remove the root if you're concerned about it. All right. And um, we have an ash that needs to be cut down. So that's kind of your last picture there. Yeah, and I think Army. if, um, I think it was showing some woodpecker holes or some bird damage. So obviously I think it's infested by a boar. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a heavy seed set as well. So it's probably a tree that is stressed and good opportunity for a replacement. All right, sooner, sooner rather than later, yeah. all right.